I just want to make sure people see this before I start assuming it that they do. So we got a yes on that, huh? Why is this stuff so important? Because uh, that's where I want to start tonight. Yep, we can see it. Okay, good. Um, here's what we're going to do tonight. Um, this is interesting how this has, has uh, developed. Um, originally, it was a uh, one evening session on the issue of how modern psychology conflicts with the Bible. And as I got involved in the research, the um, scope of the subject just kept growing. And uh, I started out on the first evening uh, talking about stuff that I had talked about before and I had studied before and any of you that are in the summit you've been exposed to uh, the whole uh, re realization that modern psychology is unbiblical, uh, not just un, but anti-biblical. And uh, so I reviewed the three main historical schools of psychology since the beginning of the so-called science of psychology, which would have been the late 1800s in the early part of the 20th century. And there were three schools, uh, three general philosophies of human behavior. Uh, basically, the Freudian psychoanalysis, the B.F. Uh, Skinner and et al. Um, behaviorism, and the so-called third force psychology, humanistic psychology. And, um, and then I introduced a, what I call a fourth school of psychology. It's way more than just a, a school of psychology. It's a, it's a whole worldview. Um, it's sociological, psychological, and political. Uh, and uh, I identified that as cultural Marxism. And then I spent considerable time trying to give a historical uh, background for this, this phenomenon that we're calling cultural Marxism. And uh, it was uh, fascinating for me uh, as I started following the rabbit trails in my uh, research. And, and that's how the, the one evening session has grown into three. And I don't think I'm even going to finish tonight. Um, and I've just, I've just been uh, very highly motivated because of how this uh, material is so relevant to uh, so many issues uh, as a, a, for, a, for the church. And um, so uh, what I want to do tonight is I'm going to start off by just maybe reviewing a little, well, I did the review, but I'm going to give you a little bit of, of uh, how this, why I think this is so relevant. And, uh, and then we're going to watch a video. Uh, and we're going to see a video by Vody Bakum. I don't know how many of you are familiar with him. Uh, but uh, this guy has a handle on this whole concept of, cultural Marxism, and he's very, very astute as to why this is so important right here, right now, in the uh, American church, not just American, but especially American. And uh, so uh, why am I so motivated? Well, here's what I think. Why, why is this stuff so important? First of all, you know, this is Wednesday night. Typically on Wednesday night, churches um, do um, supplementary stuff, elective courses, extracurricular material, special interest topics. Um, and in a sense, you know, if you have a, a sort of a intellectual curiosity, cultural Marxism may feel like it's sort of a special interest topic. Uh, but what I want to do to start off tonight is make the case that this content is at the heart of why this generation is turning its back on Christianity. 
is at the heart of why so many, and actually we've been seeing this, this statistic for uh, 20 years or longer, especially with our association with Summit Ministries, uh, as many as 75% of kids from Christian homes are abandoning their Christian roots. And when you really want to face the reality of why, we have to recognize they're not being lured away from Christianity because they're so attracted to Buddhism or Islam or, or New Age spirituality. They're leaving because they accept one or more of the lies of political correctness. Now, political correctness is a broad umbrella for a whole lot of lies that conflict with what the Bible says. For example, being gay is not a choice. Intolerance is the worst of all hate crimes. Inclusiveness is the highest virtue. Systematic racism is real and incurable. And I, we're going to hit upon this tonight. You're going you're to hear uh, from a Vody uh, Bachman. He's going to clarify this whole thing about systemic, I think I called it systematic, but it's, systemic is the right word, systemic racism. He's going to hit that one right between the eyes. Uh, another one of the political correct lies. White privilege is the cause of all kinds of social injustice. You know, I just finished up a school year with a uh, two different homeschool co-ops. And uh, I noticed particularly in one group I had this year, uh, and it, and it, just, it just gripped me, the young folks, and I'm talking 16-year-olds on an average, uh, that were raised in Christian homes. Um, they have this innocence, they have this faith that's, that's just refreshing. It's just wonderful to be around. And uh, they have a zeal. And, uh, you know, when they talk about what they're going to do with their lives, I mean, wow, I mean, the sky is the limit. They're going to serve God, and they're just going to, you know, change the world for them. Um, and it's just, it just really a blessing to see. However, a lot of that good intentions is being hijacked. But when they reach the university and they start interacting with the student body, that's a progressive atheistic worldview, uh, particularly with their professors, and um, a lot of them get hijacked into social justice causes. Um, and one of the things I hope that we can, you know, settle in our thinking uh, is that social justice is one of the most um, deceptive of all the movements in probably the history of this country. Uh, because one of the things it does is it, it hijacks uh, young people with all kinds of good intentions. They want to make the world a better place. They want to, you know, the Christian kids, they want to serve God. Uh, and, and they get caught up in these, um, basically, we're going to find out, uh, it's just power struggles. Uh, and they're not driven, really, by... Uh, a, a real desire for justice because it's a new concept or a new, it, it's justice redefined. It's not biblical justice. It's power struggle, quote, just, justice, unquote. And uh, a whole lot of young people uh, just, just get deceived. Um, and uh, so this is one of the things that really personally bugs me. And I want to you know, hopefully contribute some truth to this whole issue. Uh, so um, some of the other lies here, all minorities are victims. Christianity is the cause of all or most or much social injustice and many, many, many more lies. And I'm just using a, a pretty broad term here when I call it political correctness. Um, but uh, th they all fall under that general 
description. Our greatest responsibility as Christians is, is Matthew 28, 18. Uh, we're, we're given the great command to go into all the world, share the gospel, teach, uh, make disciples, teach everything that Jesus taught his disciples. And many or most Christians want to deliver the gospel ignoring political correctness. And this is what's got, got me going on this. I just think that's a very naive approach. Political correctness is diametrically opposed to biblical revelation. You cannot believe in both. So if they're going to get seduced into believing political correctness, they're at odds with the gospel. And all the Christians, all the you know pastors, all the evangelists, all the parachurch that wants to try and evangelize the world and ignore political correctness. When the world deceives a person with political correct thinking, that person has to make a choice, the gospel or political correctness, because they're in diametric opposition. Those who think you can, uh, the, you do not have to make this choice, they're already taken captive. And here's the passage. You know, Maranatha, you're so familiar with this one. Uh, See to it that no one takes you captive by the philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Oh, it's so sad how much of this being taken captive has, has you know, is, is going on right now as we speak in uh, amongst young uh, Christians. And uh, so uh, that's why we're dealing with this concept of, of cultural Marxism. Um, uh, we we want to understand, you know, I'm not, like I say, I, I'm not a, a, a witch hunter of communists in the sense of the you know, Communist Party. Um, but we need to be aware of, you know, the, the fact that Marxism is much broader than the Communist Party, the Soviet Union, the People's Republic of China. It's a worldview. It's an atheistic worldview. And it takes people captive. Uh, you can't believe in this political stuff, uh, political correct stuff, and, and believe also in, in the Bible. Uh, and if you're going to believe that, you're not even on our side anymore. And so uh, we, we need to see, uh, number one, the, you know, the historical background. But more than that, we need to see how it's opposed uh, to the Bible. And I don't think anybody has a better understanding than uh, Vody Baca, and um, I'm not going to introduce Vody. He's he, he's going to introduce himself in the video. Uh, just a little warning. It starts out a little slow, but it heats up. It gets really heated. Uh, I'm not talking about emotionally heated, but I'm talking about spiritually heated. This this is uh, Vody understands this issue. He understands how serious an issue it is uh, in uh, the, not the church, but the whole culture today. So I'm going to ask Parnes, can you put that video on now? And uh, hopefully our all of our sound is going to work and we're going to see them. You ready to fly with that? Yeah, if you can unshare your uh, screen temporarily. All right. Uh, okay. There you go. Give me a sec. How many people we got? Any any stragglers? Uh, yeah, we picked up a couple. We picked up uh, Amber and uh, McKelsey. Oh, good. Hi, Kelsey. Hi, Petersons. <coughs> Can you all see that? Yep. Can you give them a full full screen or? Oh, it doesn't matter. It should Don't be worry full about screen right now, right? Pardon? Should be full screen right now, right? Uh, I don't know. It's not for me, but don't worry about it. 
ask others what they're seeing. It's Can you guys see both? for me. Okay. It's full screen for me. All right, okay. here we go. Talking about for a long time. And my assignment tonight is to address the topic of cultural Marxism. And it's a topic that I have been and talking about for a long time. And it's a topic that most people didn't want to hear me talk about, but now um, for some strange reason, people are finding it uh, more relevant. There's a passage of scripture um, that, that I want to read for us. It's from the book of First Chronicles chapter 12. First Chronicles chapter 12. I was trying to think about a passage of scripture, you know, I mean, talking about cultural Marxism. Like, where's that text, you know? Um, and this is not a text on cultural Marxism, but I, I believe it's a text um, that really explains the importance of us addressing this issue tonight. First Chronicles chapter 12, beginning of verse 23. These are the numbers of the divisions of the armed troops who came to David in Hebron to turn the kingdom of Saul over to him according to the word of the Lord. So David, the man after God's own heart, is, a, is about to inherit the kingdom. He's about to become king. And there are men who came with him because if you're going to be king, if you're going to govern God's people, if you're going to lead God's people, um, there's some things that you need. Amen? The men of Judah bearing shield and spear were 6,800 armed troops. Of the Simeonites, mighty men of valor for war, 7,100. Of the Levites, 4,600. The prince Jehoiada of the house of Aaron, and with him, 3,700. Zadok, a young man, mighty in valor, and 22 commanders from his own father's house. Of the Benjaminites, the kinsmen of Saul, 3,000, of whom the majority to that point kept their allegiance to the house of Saul. Of the Ephraimites, 20,800 mighty men of valor, famous men in their father's house. Of the half-tribe of Manasseh, 18,000, who were expressly named to come and make David king. Of Issachar, men who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. 200 chiefs and all their kinsmen under their command. Swords, shield, mighty men of valor. You need all that. Amen? But you also need some men who understand the times so that you know what you ought to do. And that's what I hope this session will be about. I hope that it will be about us trying to understand the times. Now, what I don't want to do is I don't want to just offer you a dry lecture on the topic of cultural Marxism which is kind of hard not to do because it is cultural Marxism. But what I want to do is sort of put this in a context to help you understand why it's important, why this matters. Pain, 